Hey everyone, welcome to Sunshine Hills Church Online. So glad you're joining with us today. Going to be a great service. Pastor Danny Hunt is going to be speaking to us out of Ephesians 4. He's got a lot. It's going to be great. Super looking forward to it. I uh, just want to give you a couple, uh, actually just three announcements, all of which take place next weekend. So next weekend, Saturday, November the 12th, uh, is our monthly Craft Together event for the ladies. That's here at the church building from 2 to 4 p.m., hosted by Francine. If you'd like more information, be sure to reach out to her or contact the church office. We want to encourage you to be a part of that. Next Sunday, November the 13th, is the day you need to return all of your Christmas child shoeboxes to the church so we can get them off to the collection facility next week. So make sure if you are packing a shoebox, you get it done this week and bring it back next Sunday on the 13th. And then next Monday, November the 14th, we've been talking about it for a number of weeks. We're super excited. It's the first ever men's testify event, chance for our men to come together and enjoy all of the blessings that we've heard about the ladies' gene event. We're going to come together, we're going to eat together, we're going to drink together, we're going to hear stories, uh, we're going to hear what God's been doing in the life of Ian Humby and what God has done in the life of Gary Meehan. Super excited to hear those two stories and just be together as men, worshiping together and fellowshipping together. So that's next Monday, November the 14th at 7 p.m. here at the church building. That's what's coming up. More soon, we're heading into Christmas very quickly, uh, and there's a lot coming up as we head into December, so stay tuned for all that information. For now, here's Pastor Danny Hunt, Ephesians chapter 4, as part of our series, A Worthy Life. Are you ready? Are you excited? Church starts now. Hello, church. We're going to be continuing our series, A Worthy Life, today, and we're going to finally be getting into Ephesians chapter 4, which is where we will find the verse uh, that we've hinged this entire title on, because in each of the books that we're examining in this series, Paul writes that we need to live a life worthy of something, and then in each book, he gives a different thing that we need to live worthy of, and in the book of Philippians, it was living a life worthy of the gospel. And here in Ephesians, it's living a life worthy of the calling. So Ephesians chapter 4, verse 1, right off the top, Paul says, As a prisoner for the Lord, I urge you to live a life worthy of the calling that you have received. Now, so far, uh, all the messages that we've had leading up to today have hinged on this verse, and all the ones after will hinge on this verse. And really, this verse is a hinge point for the entire book of Philippians. Chapters 1 to 3 leading up to this are very philosophical, very high concept. Paul is talking a lot more in terms of uh, truth about God, truth about our, our calling in him. And so those messages were very much focused on what that calling is that we're meant to live worthy of. And the byproduct of that is that all of those messages were quite introspective, uh, quite uh, contemplative in comparison with where we're going to be going in chapters 4, 5, and 6, which now focus on the living worthy part of what Paul has to teach us. So, I th thank you for bearing with us through some messages that maybe weren't as uh, physically practical as we always um, like to have in our messages, yet uh, it's good to set the stage to talk about the calling, and now we're going to talk about living worthy of it. And what better way to do that than by jumping into Ephesians chapter 4, where we have this list that Paul gives us so often called the five-fold ministry. And it's these five offices or, or roles in the church that Paul outlines. And he talks about um, their importance uh, to building up the church and why God gave us these people in and amongst our congregations in order to lift us up, to build us up, to strengthen us. So without further ado, let's read it. Chapter 4, we're going to read verses 11 to 16. And this is what Paul says. He says, so Christ himself gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the pastors, and the teachers to equip his people for works of service so that the body of Christ may be built up until we all reach unity in the faith and in the knowledge of the Son of God and become mature attaining to the whole measure of the fullness of Christ. Then 
We will no longer be like infants tossed back and forth by the waves and blown here and there by every wind of teaching and by the cunning and craftiness of people in their deceitful scheming. Instead, speaking the truth in love, we will grow to become in every respect the mature body of him who is the head, that is, Christ. From him, the whole body, joined and held together by every supporting ligament, grows and builds itself up in love as each part does its work. So let's pray, and then we'll get into the text. Father God, thank you for your word. Thank you that we can go on this journey together as a church. Thank you for all that you've spoken to us so far in this series and all that you will speak to us through this series. God, we desire nothing more than to know you, to know your purposes for us uh, in and through your word. So would your Holy Spirit illuminate those things to us today in Jesus' name. Amen. So you see in the opening section there the five offices or the five roles, apostle, prophet, evangelist, pastor, teacher. And we'll get to those and, and kind of define them better. But <clears throat> first, I want to focus in a little bit on the reasoning that Paul gives. He says that Christ gave us these gifts in the church. And then he says the reason for it. He says so that the church will be built up, that there's this strengthening, there's this building, that there's a foundation, and then we're building on top of it. He says so that the church would achieve unity. I mean, already in this series, we've talked a lot about the importance of unity. It's something very important to Christ, that his church would be unified, that people would not be divided and in conflict, but instead we would find peace and love and unity with each other. Uh, And he talks about growing in maturity, which is something that uh, we often don't necessarily talk about in those terms in the church, I think. But Paul, you know, he often in his writing, and and Peter's the same way in his writing, talks about this moving from uh, being uh, an infant in your spirituality to being a mature adult in your spirituality. And that comes with wisdom and experience. As we get to know God more, we get to know ourselves more. So that's part of what the goal of these gifts is, that we would achieve wisdom uh, and maturity. And Paul contrasts that with the image of, uh, he says, don't be infants tossed about by the waves. Now, I have never seen uh, a ship crewed entirely by babies, but I cannot imagine that it goes well. So he wants us to be fully adept men and women of God, mature in our faith, Furthermore, he talks about standing against heresy. I love this part where he says that we won't be blown about by every wind of teaching and the deceitful scheming and the craftiness and the cunning of people. There are people who desire to lead us astray. That's their goal, is whether it's for personal gain, whether it's for some um, you know, greed or whatever. We are constantly buffeted by the winds of false teaching. We've talked about this before, that there's so many voices in this world. We need to be sure that we're mature Christians who know the correct voice to listen to, the voice of the Holy Spirit, God's word, and what he wants for us. Not every fad, not every televangelist, not every person who claims to be speaking for God uh, should be listened to without a grain of salt at the very least. Now, something that I have noticed, and and this is something that bugged me even before I felt called into the ministry myself, is that so often in our modern churches, we expect all five of these gifts to be covered by one person, the lead pastor. We expect that whoever's leading our church would exhibit all five of these, that the lead pastor would be our apostle, the one who's leading on the forefront, the one who's planting churches and, and birthing new ministries. We expect that our lead pastor would be the prophet, the one who hears from God for the congregation, who speaks the word of God to us. We expect that the lead pastor would be our evangelist. Well, if I can just invite my friend to come and hear the pastor speak, then that'll get my friend saved. I don't have to preach to them. They'll, they should just come to church. We expect the lead pastor to be a pastor, to care for the flock and to, to comfort and to visit the sick and all those things. And we expect the lead pastor to be our teacher, to be the most biblically literate, the one who passes on all that information to the congregation. And this is not the model. It's not what the Bible seems to be communicating. Paul is very clear that there's there's all sorts of people in these roles. It's not ever meant to be just on one person. 
Now, unfortunately, I have seen what happens when a church walks down this road where it's a, a consumer congregation and a five-fold pastor. And I'll tell you what it leads to. It leads to pastoral burnout really quick. Uh, and it leads to immature Christians who don't participate, who don't feel built up in their faith, and uh, ultimately the church suffers. Now, I don't think that's our church, and I thank God for that. Uh, But we need to always be aware that it doesn't become our church because the temptation of consumer Christianity is always there. That little voice, that little tempting feeling that would just say, like, just show up. You know, you can just let that let someone else handle it. You just come get what you need and go. And that's not what God has for us. He wants us to engage. He wants us to connect with one another. He wants us to collectively build this thing called the church. Now, something I love about Foursquare as a denomination is that one of the stated values of our movement is that every member is a minister. There is no such thing in Foursquare as a clergy and layman. There's no such thing as like, oh, well, these people work for the church and are therefore more holy or more, you know, more specially trained at this, that, and the other thing. We believe that every single person in the church has a unique calling, a unique gifting from God, and that every person is important. No one is more central or important to God's plan than another person. You have been called by God. You have an amazing destiny laid out for you by Jesus. He has plans and purposes for you, and you are not discounted just because of the title that you get to put on a business card. We are all ministers in God's church. Now, jumping into these five offices, and there's a lot of different teaching on this. And I'm going to give some definitions that I have uh, subscribed to myself, that have been taught to me, that I've thought through, and that I feel work. But in transparency and honesty, these are not agreed upon definitions across every denomination of the church. There's a lot of discussion on this, and so I encourage you, read your Bible, work it out for yourself. But This is something that um, I found really resonated with me and with what I was experiencing in church around me. And I don't think that um, every single person is entirely one of these five things. I think what we're talking about here includes shades of gray and includes um, seasons of life that maybe our giftings will change depending on our season, our situation, what God needs from us in that time or wants from us in that time. Uh, But let's go through each of the five and just talk about what they mean and how they look in a modern context. So the first one up would be the apostle. And this is a big one because we don't often throw that word around so much these days. But I was always taught that there's big A apostles and there's little A apostles. And so like when you look at the Bible and you see the 12 apostles, including uh, the 13th, which would be Paul, Apostle Paul, they get the big A capital A, Apostle, because they witnessed, resurrected Jesus speaking to them and walking with them. And so they were given special uh, dispensation for the birth of the church. And I think it's pretty clear from reading scripture that there was a very special calling and grace on those people individually that you know, we don't have people today that get to write books of the Bible. And if anyone claims that they wrote a new book of the Bible, you run. But There's also little a apostles, and this is one of those places where denominations disagree. A lot of uh, teaching out there says that the gift of apostleship died out uh, in the first century, that there was just those guys and then it was over. But uh, to me, that just doesn't jive with what I see in the Bible. God doesn't frequently waste words in his uh, scripture. And so to me, there's just there's a lot of teaching on this that I think is still for us today and that there are little a apostles, people with the gift of apostleship. So what do I mean by that? Well, looking at the biblical model, an apostle is someone who is sent. That's what it means, the sent one. And so I think in a modern context, we can see the gift of apostleship in missionaries, in people who plant churches or plant new ministries, new expressions of the church. Often uh, the gift of apostleship is coupled with leadership, that they're on the front lines of a new thing that the church is doing, pushing into new territory. And that accompanied with that is miracles and healing. The working uh, of miracles is to be expected on for, from those who are on the front lines, pushing into the darkness, so to speak. And so I think that that to me, is what apostleship looks like 
today. Next up would be the prophet. And again, I'm thankful to have grown up in this church where the the gift of prophecy was celebrated and where there is room for people to express that gift. But again, it's one that's very commonly misunderstood. When we say prophet, we don't mean a seer or a fortune teller. It doesn't have to be future casting. Prophecy just means uncovering. It means communicating God's heart, his will, and his words to his church. Uh, and so when we have someone come up on a Sunday morning to, to share a word uh, during our ministry time, that is an expression of prophecy. And maybe they will, uh, you know, give a word for the future. Maybe they give a word for the moment. Or maybe they just encourage the congregation with God's word out of Scripture. All of that is still bound up in this idea of prophecy. There's also an element of the prophetic in what I do as a preacher or what our worship leaders do when they bring uh, their set lists and and perform for us to to lead us in worship. When I sit down to write a message, I'm praying for the Holy Spirit to be revealing to me what we should be reading together, what I should be saying, and, and what truth can come out of the Bible. And there's an element of the prophetic in that. And our worship leaders, they're not just picking their favorite playlist. They are praying and asking the Holy Spirit to guide them, to speak to them. And then they're bringing songs that will encourage us and will be good for the moment, good for that day. And there is prophecy in that as well. The next up is the evangelist. Evangelists are bearers of the good news, those who carry the word of God out into the world. I like to think of evangelists as inviters, people who invite. And sort of that first evangelist in, in the book of John is, is Andrew, who meets Jesus. And then it says that the first thing he did is he went and he brought Peter, his brother, to meet Jesus. That's the evangelist's heart, saying, like, I just met Jesus. You should meet him, too. They're the inviters. They're the, the, the ones who reach out to the lost and share the gospel far and wide. And then we have the pastors, Again, this is a word that today has just become a Swiss army knife of Christian wording. That, like the pastor is, is everything at the same time. But from a biblical perspective, pastor is just a shepherd. It's the person who looks inward to the church to make sure that the flock is healthy and wealthy and wise, so to speak. Not wealthy, that's not the correct one, but you know what I mean. This is the person who's looking inward, who's caring for the sheep, caring for the flock, defending the flock against false teachers or those who would do the church harm, uh, strengthening, encouraging, visiting, making sure that people feel connected and loved and supported. And then we finally have the teachers, and probably this is the one that needs the least definition because we're all familiar with the idea of a teacher. But from a biblical perspective, there's two elements that really make this gifting uh, part of the church. One is that in a biblical sense, teachers point to God's word. They point to the Bible. They point to Scripture. They point to the things that God has said. And secondly, teachers carry Uh, information from generation to generation. Teachers are the ones in the church that God has placed to know where we've been, to know what we've done, to know who we've seen, so that we can know where we're going. Teachers help to inform and to bring knowledge, whether it's biblical knowledge or historical knowledge or technical knowledge, to serve the church. Now, you've heard me use the word office for all five of these. And that's a very churchy word. And Really what it's getting at is that all five of these do represent roles that a person can inhabit, almost like an occupation or a job, uh, but in a spiritual sense. And there are people out there who are prophets. There are people out there who are pastors. There are people out there who are teachers. That's what God has called them to do. But on top of just being roles, I do believe that all five of these things represent giftings as well. That maybe you are not called to be a prophet, but maybe you have the gift of prophecy for a season or for a whole time. Uh, Myself, I don't feel that my role is prophet. I feel that my role is pastor. But I have often operated in the gift of prophecy, which helps to support me in the role to which God has called me. But more than just roles and giftings, I think there's also an element here of Christian responsibility that all five of these things represent uh, roles that someone can inhabit. They represent gifting, supernatural talents that God gives to people for a time. 
And they also represent Christian responsibilities that every single one of us should be engaging with, at least on some level. I'll use evangelist as an example. There are some people who they just, they inhabit the role of the evangelist. And if you've been around church long enough, you know someone like this who's just, they're a natural inviter. It's what they do. It's so clearly what God has placed them here for is to just bring people in to share the gospel. And there's others who have the gift of evangelism. And maybe it's, again, for a season, they just have this supernatural enabling. And when they share the gospel, it seems to just be so effective. And they're given the right words and they're given the right opportunities. And the Holy Spirit is really on them for that. But the existence of those evangelists or those people with the gift of evangelism doesn't let the rest of us off the hook from evangelizing. There's a Christian responsibility here that we would all share the gospel, whether it's your full-time calling, whether it's just a gifting that God has given you or not, we're all called to do it on some level. So this brings me to the practical side of this, because I wanted something really that we could sink our teeth into, something that you could go from here and, and get your hands dirty with on a Monday morning. So we're going to go through what I am calling the five-fold five-by-five which just rolls right off the tongue. Now, some disclaimers before we get into this. Not everything that I'm going to mention here is applicable or appropriate for every person. This isn't supposed to be an exhaustive list or a checklist or a to-do list. What I wanted to put together is just some uh, basic, simple practices that maybe we could try, that you could choose to implement one or two into your Christian walk. And the point is to start to identify giftings in our lives. There's a, a, a thrust here of discovery, of refining, and of serving. As we do these things, maybe you will discover your role. Maybe you will discover that you are a teacher. You are a, an evangelist. Maybe you already knew that you had that gifting or that that was your role. And in that case, these are um, uh, practices that will help refine that thing in your walk with Christ. Or maybe you'll discover that you're not one of those things, that you don't have that spiritual gift necessarily, yet these are all still great things for us to serve the church, to build it up. Uh, and discovering what you're not gifted at is often as important as discovering what you are gifted at, so we can find our God-given lane and run in it with everything that we have. So one final disclaimer, this is not church bingo. You don't get to just tick off that you've done all of the ones in a column and then start introducing yourself to people as prophet so-and-so. It's not how this works. Again, this is just some ground-level stuff. I wanted to give some practical application. What can we be doing to start to find our inner apostle, pastor, prophet, teacher, evangelist? So let's start with the apostle. If you want to start to know sort of the gift of apostleship in your life, some great stuff to start with. Pray for healing. Pray for healing. Lay hands on the sick. Uh, have faith that they will recover. We see that in the New Testament, and we follow that model. Furthermore, pray for miracles. Expect God to move mightily in impossible circumstances. And this is a twofold one, because when we pray for miracles, we're simultaneously having a faith exercise, trusting that God will move, but we're also having an observing exercise, because to know where... Um, a miracle is needed, you need to be heads up and paying attention to the, the needs around you. We can go on missions trips, whether that's local, uh, something like working with City Dream Center or with Night Shift, or whether that's international, going to Denmark like Thomas did, going to Mexico, as our church has done a number of times. Uh, going on a missions trip, partnering with missions is a great way to learn uh, your skills, to learn your God-given gifts and abilities. You could launch a life group. Again, this won't be for everyone, but it's a good question to ask. Is there a life group in your area that serves your demographic, the people who live near you, your friends and family? And if not, are you the one God is calling to launch that, to start something, or maybe to host something? And then partnered with that, we could start a ministry. And I'm going to brag on uh, someone from our church um, for a little bit here, because Francine, who many of you know, uh, I think is just, I, I really want to encourage her and uh, let you know about sort of the process that I saw her walk because I think it's a great model. Francine came to us. She had identified a need in the church that there are, uh, there's a need for grief counseling for people who have experienced grief to find 
a group of people who will sit with them, who will talk through their pain with them, uh, and all of that stuff. And so not only did she identify the need, but then she had vision for a solution to that need, and that is the grief share group. And then, on top of that, she executed that vision. She asked for the resources to see that vision come to pass, and she led it herself and is currently leading it. And so in that pattern, what we see is apostleship. Now, I don't think that Francine necessarily needs to go around introducing herself as Apostle Francine, but we see that the gifts uh, listed here in Ephesians 4 have varying degrees, and even something like what she did, being able to see a need, have vision for that need, and then lead the solution to that need, she created a new expression of the body of Christ, and that to me represents this gift of apostleship. So let's go on to prophet. First things first. Read your Bible. Now, I know that maybe when I said that I'd be talking about getting into prophecy, you maybe expected me to say, go stand on a mountain with big tablets of God's word. But we cannot get into prophecy if we don't read our Bibles. How am I supposed to hear God's voice in here if I'm not used to already hearing his voice in here? The Bible is the word of God. And before we have any pretenses of becoming prophets, we need to be rooted and built up in the word that God has given us through his scriptures. Secondly, we need to cultivate a rich prayer life. And again, these are those things that like every Christian should be doing, but they also help to point us to to soften the ground towards uh, finding out if we have this gift or the role of prophecy. Because as we cultivate a rich prayer life, as we get used to hearing God's word for us, we will get used to hearing God's word for others. Uh, When it comes to giving a word to another person, we can encourage them with scripture. So often, uh, if someone is down or in crisis or in need of uh, lifting up, the answer is found in God's word. He was pretty wise when he wrote down everything he wrote down for us. And being able to just share the word of God from the Bible to a person, that is prophetic. That is sharing the words of God with another person. But additionally, we can encourage people in the spirit, and maybe you've been the recipient of this kind of prophetic action, being able to pray for someone and then being faithful to encourage them with whatever the Holy Spirit is prompting us to share. And finally, we can encourage the congregation by bringing a word, as you've seen done on a Sunday morning here. Now, the next on the list is the evangelist. And the first thing first, it starts with prayer. Prayer for the lost. If we want to uh, uncover our inner evangelist, if we want to strengthen that evangelistic gift in our, us, and again, this is something we're all called to, we need to cultivate a heart for the lost. We need to be praying for those who don't know Jesus. We also just need to share the gospel. This is probably like the simplest one, the easiest and most straightforward. Uh, if you want to be evan- an evangelist, you have to share the gospel. It's something we're all called to do. A great way to get into that is volunteering with kids. Often what we're teaching when we volunteer with kids is simple gospel messages delivered in a simple way. Jesus says that we can't inherit the kingdom of heaven unless we inherit it like little children, unless we come to him with the hearts of children. So teaching children and and communicating biblical truth to them and gospel truth to them isn't uh, a dumbed down version. It's actually a foundational version that strengthens us for when we go out to share with adults. Uh, We can be inviters. We can invite our friends to church or to the men's testify event or the women's gene event or any of those things. Being like Andrew and just saying, hey, I know Jesus. You should come know Jesus. Come with me to church and come and meet this community. And then finally, we can share our testimonies. Your story is one of your most powerful tools for evangelism. God has given you a unique story to share. At the very least, being able to say, I once was lost, now I'm found. I once was hopeless, and now I have hope. What about pastor? How do we strengthen the the role, the gifting, the responsibility of pastoral care in our lives? First things first, like the evangelist prays for the lost, the pastor prays for the found. Pastoral heart is for the church. Are you praying for the church? Are you praying for the people that sit beside you on a Sunday morning or who watch with you online? 
Praying for the church and cultivating a heart for the church is important. And then we also need to watch for lost sheep. Watch for those who are on the edges, who are sitting alone, who uh, don't necessarily seem to be connected. Maybe you're the one God is calling to go connect with them. And the next two kind of involve that connection. That would be weeping with those who weep, the sort of holy empathy that when people are going through crisis, we don't uh, scoff, we don't look down on them. And in fact, we get down in the trenches with them and support them. And then also asking for people's stories. And the corollary to that would be listening when they share their stories and without judgment, but just being an ear to hear what they need to share. On top of that, we can visit the sick or those who are homebound. Maybe you can't visit them physically. Maybe you can't get out to go to the hospital. But we could call, we could send them a message, an encouragement. But just showing one another that love and that care and that unity is part of the pastoral gift and the pastoral heart. Finally, we have the teacher. So if we want to strengthen the gift of teaching in our lives, we need to read more. We need to read our Bibles. We need to read other material as well to really start to get into the Bible more. There's commentaries, there's uh, narratives, there's books that have been written by pastors and scholars and leaders and people who share their experience echoing through the ages that we have access to. Uh, As any of the educators in our church would tell you, before you can be a teacher, you must first be a learner. And then we point people to the Bible Again, the biblical model for teacher is to just point people back to God, point people to his word over and over again. And by the way, this doesn't mean knowing all the answers yourself. So often, the gift of teaching is expressed in saying, I actually don't know the answer to that question, but let's go find out together. I'd love to help you. Teachers train people not just in a biblical sense, but also just in all the other areas. God has gifted you with skills, abilities, knowledge, personal experiences that you can pass on. I know people that had the gift of teaching that were uh, kind enough to teach me how to do things like make a latte in the coffee shop or teach me how to run the soundboard at the back of the church. Those skills build the church as we pass them on, as we refine them, and as we teach them to one another. Maybe you are called to mentor someone. This is that sort of broader version where we see someone coming up under us in a similar vein of life and being able to wrap our arms around them and say, hey, I've got uh, some wisdom to share with you. Maybe my experience can be of benefit to you. Uh, And then finally, you could teach in your life group. If you're part of a life group, you could go, if you are feeling that this is an area that maybe God has gifted you in, you could go to your life group leader and say, hey, is it okay if I teach one week and, and prep the lesson? There's lots of areas that we can express these gifts in the church. Because overall, these five offices, giftings, responsibilities, whatever we want to call them, it comes back to what Paul is saying, that God has given us these things for the equipping of the church for good works, that we would build one another up, that we would unify uh, as a church through the gifts that he's given us. And again, you might not be an apostle. You might not be a prophet. Not everyone's an evangelist. Not everyone is a pastor and not everyone is a teacher. And thank God for that, that he's given us a diversity of gifts in his church. But I'll tell you what we all are. We are all brothers and sisters in Christ called to build one another up, to strengthen one another, and to push forward this thing called the church that God loves so much. Let's pray. Father, thank you for your word. Thank you for um, the fact that you desire to partner with us. You don't want consumers. You don't want an audience. You want co-laborers, people who will come arm in arm, to walk out the calling that you have for us. God, help us to live worthy of the calling that we have received. I pray that you would open our eyes to see our giftings, that you would start to communicate to us where we fit in this thing called the church, where we fit in the expression of the church that we find ourselves in. Lord, would you illuminate to us our unique talents I want to just pray for those who feel that you are not gifted, 
who feel like maybe the church has passed you by and there's other people who are so much more talented or anything like that. And I want to just pray because that is a lie from the enemy. You are gifted because the Holy Spirit has given you gifts. You are valuable because God has declared that you are valuable. I want to just pray that way. God, for those who struggle with this idea of calling and giftedness, who have uh, heard the lie that they are not called, that they have no destiny, that they have no gifts, Lord, I just, I dispel that lie of the enemy in Jesus' name. I ask that you would speak words of encouragement to them. God, that you would show them the areas that they are uniquely designed to fill in your church. Lord Jesus, we trust in you and we thank you that you have a plan and a purpose for all of our lives. And that plan and purpose includes partnering with you as you uh, bring to bear your glorious glorious plans for this world and for the people in our communities and our neighborhoods and our families. For those who are watching who don't know Jesus as their personal Savior, I'd love for you to come meet him. Again, I said it before and I'll say it again, the, the simplest testimony that I can give is that I once was without hope. I once was lost. I once felt like I was in darkness But thanks to Jesus, I have hope, I have found light, and I feel found in him. I feel the love of God like never before. And you can experience that too just by praying along with me. Lord Jesus, I thank you that you died on the cross for my sins. I repent of all the ways that I have walked away from you, and now I walk towards you, and I acknowledge that you are my Lord and my Savior. In Jesus' name, amen. Now, if you prayed that prayer, I'd love to hear about it. Please share it with uh, someone you trust, a brother or sister in Christ. We welcome you into the family of the church. And hey, like I said in this sermon, there's lots of opportunity to get connected, to get plugged in, and to serve and to use your God-given gifts and abilities to strengthen your community. So thank you all for spending this time with me today. I hope to see you soon. We've got lots coming up. I know it's already November, so Christmas season is right around the corner. If you haven't gotten a a copy of our Advent Activity Guide, you can get that on our website. You can also see it on our social media. Uh, It's a great booklet to just sort of give a different activity every day of December leading up to Christmas. Fun for families or for singles, for people to do with groups of friends. So we wanted to make it uh, practical for everyone. But yeah, get your hands on that. It's going to be super fun. And I'll see you again soon.